will introduce Isaac Trigo, um, who is with Incognito. Um, and he's going to be talking about um, another operator uh, real world use case um, through the lens of incognito software. And uh, it's pretty interesting. So here we go. Thank you, Jason. So indeed, today we will talk about uh, this uh, use case in a tier one mobile network operator in America. We'll talk a bit about uh, fixed wireless access, which is the main use case that this operator was looking into. And uh, as Jason mentioned, I've been with uh, Incognito Software for a bit more than five years now. I take care of the, the pre-sales activities. For those of you that are not familiar, that familiar with Incognito, sometimes we do too good of a job while honoring the name of the company. We are a Canadian company that is focused on the OSS software vendor for more than 30 years with uh, both customers and uh, deployment, uh, services, organization, all across the globe. We have been uh, pretty much since the beginning looking at the areas of device provisioning, device management, with, uh, which is where the large majority of, the customer, of our customers are. And as part of that, uh, we naturally gravitated to the use of uh, USB. What was it, I think, uh, five, six years ago? You may have seen some of my colleagues in this summit earlier on. Not much more to, to say about it. I know that everyone is probably in uh, a bit tired about uh, hearing uh, too much sales speeches and too much repetition somehow about the some of the concepts. We heard uh, a lot about them uh, yesterday and a bit uh, more today. So we will uh, I will try to be light on that on that part. We'll speak a bit about uh, fixed wireless access, the market opportunity, the typical challenges that are needed, the evolution, the expectations for the future as well. And then we will focus on this uh, tier one in, in America's region where uh, we have deployed a USB large uh, environment with our uh, Incognito DX, uh, DX solution. We will be looking a bit in, in detail into the use cases around the device management, troubleshooting, telemetry. It, it will not uh, come as a huge surprise based on the conversations that we have had right before the, the break, but uh, it's good to see uh, more and more of these uh, deployments uh, coming out in, in different regions as well and with different technologies, so absolutely. Uh, if uh, time allows, we will uh, briefly talk also around the, the next steps, the opportunities that are open for for this type of deployment in particular around the fixed wireless the fixed wireless access uh, scenarios and uh, yeah we will close if uh, people is in the in the right mood and not uh, too tired uh, not uh, to nap uh, before uh, right after the lunch hopefully we are able to keep it to keep it that way fixed wireless access uh, an area that uh, has grown significantly in the past uh, three, four years, that is also planned to grow significantly in in the next four or five. Uh, in this uh, particular slide, we are showing the uh, how different it is in terms of market share per region. And it's uh, indeed almost a large majority in, of the connections in places like Asia Pac. But uh, even in areas where it is just, uh, uh, let's say, 10%, 15%, 20%, it is also a kind of gaining traction. For references, the, the overall figures that we have uh, today, based on this data, I think are coming from, from an Ericsson study, are around 130 million connections worldwide. By 2029, the expectation is that it uh, almost uh, becomes three times that, in the over 3 million. 300 million connections. So definitely uh, an area of, of interest for several reasons, obviously. Uh, one of them is the, the role, the ability to proceed very quickly with the rollouts in areas that uh, there are already significant uh, incumbents with fixed uh, broadband networks. That is a bit less of a concern. But in, in, even in people that are looking at uh, things like replacing existing copper architecture, replacing uh, by fiber, which is all the rage, obviously, 
uh, in, in Europe, for example, uh, they, they look into fixed wireless in order to serve uh, some of the more rural areas where it is it becomes too expensive to roll out uh, fiber everywhere. Even uh, if this is what uh, we are hearing somehow in the, in the, in the, other, in the base track. Rollout to speed, the fact that it allows uh, traditional uh, operators that were focused mostly on the mobile space to uh, tap a bit into the, the revenues around uh, around fixed broadband, let's say, is another important consideration. And also for some uh, for some operators, it may open uh, other other areas around uh, other markets, not just the traditional B2C, but also B2B or B2B2X. We'll talk a bit about that as, as well. But again, don't uh, want to get you too, too bored with the with the context, we'll probably talk a bit more about uh, fixed wireless in in the Q and A sections. We have some funny statistics around that. One of the uh, in this case, uh, we are focusing on this uh, this operator in in America's region, and uh, what they were looking is uh, th they had already a, a significant deployment based on TR zero sixty nine. Or traditional traditional devices, but uh, they were uh, planning to roll out uh, fixed wireless in uh, at massive scale, let's say. And as part of that, they had a number of uh, of concerns, of challenges, in a way that they was not sure that the current uh, way of doing things were were able to do, and that is why they started looking into into USP. As part of that. The ability, we have listed the three of them uh, here, three of the main ones, the ability to roll out the service uh, very quickly, the ability to uh, to be able to adjust uh, to the to the requirements, add additional controllers. You can already hear from this, uh, sounds very much uh, typical cloud-related requirements. It was here as well, absolutely. The expectations around the service quality in uh, around fixed broadband, I mean, even if it's delivered through the the mobile network, something that I was surprised when researching the for this uh, this presentation is that the the expectations in the in the subscribers around the quality and around the price are actually quite high for a fixed wireless based on the changes in technology. We are obviously not having to go through the 2G, 3G networks. With LTE, with 5G, the networks have improved significantly. And actually, I noticed a funny statistic in, in America, in this case, I think, an analysis by, by a different company, was coming out with two thirds of the existing fixed wireless access customers uh, noticing or, ex or saying, claiming that their service was provided as a fair price which was significantly better than what they were saying for cable, for DSL, or for even fiber, where it was barely uh, 50%. So yeah, the expectations in terms of being able to keep that quality high and all the ability to perform all types of traditional diagnostics, uh, traditional tests, automated, uh, flows around that and definitely keep track of the different uh, parameters in the in the network they were they were important for that and also very specific uh, not only specific around fixed wireless access but uh, as well the ability to to have a very good visibility on the location of the CPE these deployments uh, make sure that the connection to the to the mobile network when deployed in in the household is uh, is optimal, let's say, and it also provides decent, decent connectivity for the Wi-Fi and be able to detect uh, properly if the if the device is actually moved. We will not talk about it uh, today. It was not really a priority for this initial, initial uh, scenario, but we have other customers that are uh, extremely concerned about keeping track of uh, whether the devices uh, for fixed wireless access are actually deployed uh, in a fixed uh, basis, or if they actually need are uh, being moved uh, across uh, the city or other cities in making use of the somewhat well, cheaper uh, plans that uh, normally operators sell. But again, this is not something that uh, we'll talk here today. We will see a bit about how all this all this information obviously fits very well with the capabilities that that USP brings around. Uh, near real-time or real-time telemetry and, and bulk data collection. 
I'm not going to go through through this slide. I'm, I don't want to make sure that everyone finished soundly asleep by now. But uh, I like it because even if it has tons of text, it is basically uh, pretty much a rehash of an internal uh, slide that our customer was making in their in their research of uh, contain uh, continuing the trend with uh, tier. Uh, tr 069 that they started some time ago or uh, moving into the tr 369 uh, bandwagon and uh, obviously the let's say uh, the benefits we have talked about them uh, a number of uh, times yesterday and today uh, i'm not gonna be emphasizing them uh, a lot only mention perhaps that from their perspective the main ones the main uh, considerations that they were taking when eventually deciding to to pick a USB were around the ability to capture massive uh, amounts of telemetry information. In this case, the uh, the much lower overhead that they were able to get uh, in terms of the the communication when compared to TR zero sixty nine. In this case, they chose, they were fairly fairly early determined to go with a lightweight version with MQTT. And then also the, uh, the others, including the ability to potentially deploy multiple controllers, although initially it is just, just one, and also the uh, deployment of uh, in-home uh, third-party uh, applications, the smart home services considerations that we were that we were hearing quite a bit about today, earlier in the morning. So very, very high level, the type of uh, solution that uh, that uh, has been deployed based on our, our incognito controller. In this case, uh, initially for uh, two vendors, the two different uh, manufacturers that uh, are supporting uh, USB for this particular operator. Uh, in this case, uh, the initial rollout was, uh, I think, uh, right uh, below a million devices. It is uh, also increasing, so that's already a, a significant deployment. And uh, the communication with these uh, these devices uh, was established by by MQTT. Yeah, showing it in in the slide here, but in fact, all the solution, all the controller is uh, is being deployed in the in the cloud in this case to ensure that we could also handle the the scalability requirements that were uh, uh, important consideration for our for our customers. Part of that, we have the the MQTT broker centralizing the traffic, configuring everything around the bulk data telemetry. Very similar scenario as where our friends in, in Vodafone, in Deutsche Telekom were were explaining, making sure that the information could be available by other by other systems in the in the organization. In this case, they are also uh, providing uh, access to the to the capabilities for customer care with uh, customer care dashboards to make sure that uh, troubleshooting directly on the on the controller can be done, communicating with the devices. We'll talk a bit about the specific scenario later and about the specific uh, KPIs and information that uh, that is uh, that is important. You can imagine it is in a way fairly fairly standard for fixed wireless access deployments, but all, nonetheless, it is uh, it is good to see that uh, the, the deployment in, in USB also bring a number of advantages. We added also the, the ability to measure these, these KPIs, to speak about uh, them. And uh, importantly, and uh, based on what I'm hearing, it's probably the one of the very first uh, deployments with the software module management in the in the application. In this case, uh, not for a third party application. Actually, this customer decided to, to work on their own internal application first, keeping always the opportunity to, to expand and potentially include additional, additional services uh, going on later. And uh, that's actually, we'll talk about it, one of the areas where uh, there is possibly uh, an, an expansion in the in the works, let's say. Obviously, integrated with the, with the overall ecosystem and the service provider, uh, API, single sign-on. We already spoke about uh, the telemetry connection, collection and allowing them to, to focus on these uh, 
let's say, two, three main use cases that they were looking at. In this case, uh, device management or traditional device management, you could say that it's a kind of implied. These are devices that were not being managed by TR069 before, that are starting straight into, into USP. And so the obvious uh, considerations about the initial uh, bootstrap, the initial, uh, let's say, things like firmware upgrades, all of that uh, was also uh, having to be included in, in this case. And as we were discussing, no, no conversation whatsoever of losing, losing functionality or anything like that. Everything that, that, uh, that TR069 allowed and then some. In this case, uh, focus as part of that, uh, th uh, things like uh, diagnostics uh, and uh, uh, troubleshooting, obviously a key scenario, uh, management of the Wi-Fi, the one and LAN networks, uh, speed tests, all of these things, and always based in the in the tier 181 data model, of course, and with a bit of a focus, if you want, on the fixed wireless access specific specific capabilities, the specific dashboards uh, to me measure the information coming from the device in near real time, information about the quality on the on the mobile network all these uh, key KPIs about signal strength, uh, signal ratios, uh, noise, all of that information as well about the specific connection, uh, kind of the the areas, the cells in the mobile network, APN, that uh, this is the devices connected is also part of that. As part of this, uh, having the ability to uh, to understand this uh, this information. In this case, I was uh, commenting with Jason before, right before the uh, the start that it is funny in a way how the considerations around uh, user consent and opt-ins and opt-outs are seen uh, a bit different in in Europe and uh, across the pond. It was not something that uh, this particular customer was focusing too much. I think in in a way. Uh, the, they accept all terms and conditions by default that are, are made simpler in, in their side, let's say. But yeah, uh, so uh, at, a, at a very high level, just to give an, an idea of the type of thing that, uh, that has been built, that is being used around these lines, and just uh, keeping, where am I with time? Not terrible, I suppose. Uh, keeping also as a foundation for the for the future, this is uh, actually a, a scenario that uh, we are looking at in the that we were looking in the in last years with the telemanagement forum as part of the Catalyst program, where also fixed wireless access has a significant impact in this case for for B B two B customers, where uh, the scenario was around providing kind of a, let's call it mini SD one where the uh, Providers could have kind of an improved guaranteed type of service quality, where one of the options in order to provide the service was around, around fixed wireless access, the alternative being fiber. So that things like when there is a, a detection of uh, not even a total, uh, total loss of the service, but also even a simple degradation on the quality as measured from protocols such as IPFIX, as as NWDAF in the in the mobile side, the service could automatically detect uh, how to uh, best provide the service and how to best ensure the SLAs that are guaranteed for for the customer. Again, based on the on the type of uh, on the type of USB controller that we are discussing. At the same time, obviously, we were talking. I have not included any any specific slides and we are getting close to the to the end of the of the allotted time but obviously all the scenarios around deployment of uh, third party applications we have been hearing earlier in the morning today from some of our partners uh, domos or fsecure we have a few others as well where we have worked just not in this particular customer yet to deploy their, their applications as part of uh, value-added services or for enhanced troubleshooting in, in some scenarios. But it's something that is definitely looking, uh, being looking at, let's say, as additional next steps. And yeah, don't want to 
to keep the session too long, focus on uh, being kind of a straight to the point, just a quick recap, reinforce the the thing that the message that USP is is here. It is no longer something that uh, was uh, planned for the next few years. As was kind of the the way for for some time already. We are starting to see, and it's good to see more of those uh, from the sessions earlier today. Real life production deployments in entire one operators that uh, make use of the benefits of of USP, and that also help us with uh, promoting the. The, the benefits of the protocol as part of, uh, of the supporters. And the uh, key consideration, again, the ability to, to scale very quickly, to react very quickly to whatever the, the workload is, in this case, uh, to be able to deploy additional services kind of at the snap of your fingers after, obviously, the initial, the initial integration has been Fully, fully tested. We are not there yet for every service, but uh, we are quite close to that with uh, select devices and select applications already. The ability to, to have this uh, razor sharp view, X-ray view, if you want, borrowing the term from my colleague, about everything that is going on in the, in the household not just in the in the main gateway we are discussing there are the ability also to receive information from other elements uh, extenders uh, we were hearing about fiber to the room in the in the other sessions around the master slave ONTs. so that is also an important source of telemetry for the for the management and to ensure this uh, let's say uh, Almost perfect, and I don't like the word perfect in terms of uh, uh, outcome, but in terms of uh, good enough service for the end customers so that they can get the expectation at the, at the price, at a fair price, which is a, a good scenario. And yeah, obviously in, uh, in our side, uh, I did not really go through that a lot. Uh, we were not the initial provider for tier 069, so it made it a bit uh, a bit harder for us to uh, to start uh, this journey with this customer. And it was mostly the reason that uh, they saw us as a trusted advisor for for USP, so our engagement with the standards fairly fairly earlier on, and the ability to provide a responsive. Uh, let's say, a solution to their needs in the in the OSS space. Also the fact that uh, we were uh, compliant enough with the, the requirements. It's not always the easiest to do business with uh, tier one operators. You need a degree of flexibility many times, but in this case, it uh, went uh, well enough for, uh, for both sides. And yeah, in terms of the, of the initial presentation, I think this is uh, what I wanted to, to to explain. So if uh, there are any questions, we'll be happy to take them. Any <clears throat> any immediate immediate questions for Isaac? So so far we are not doing that much with uh, FWA, but. Do you see any significant difference in terms of the USP adoption in an FWA device compared to a more traditional device? In a way, it's the the specific use cases that are a bit different. As I think you were mentioning about uh, other use cases. Uh, I think it was uh, actually him explaining about uh, how USP as an enabler of uh, implementation, how to, let's say, simplify the inclusion of, of USB, justify the need of that. I think in this case, the, the need of a new service based on fixed wireless access was that uh, naturally highlighted some of the benefits that USB could provide, things around the telemetry, that, but are not specific for fixed wireless, but also allowed to uh, convince the internal stakeholders in the company that uh, USB was the right way to, the right way to go. This scenario, same as uh, for other uh, cases, such as what we were discussing about uh, locating uh, 
physically where the device is, potentially geofencing scenarios, getting the visibility in near real time or allows you to react in, in very quickly and very conveniently if, uh, in these type of scenarios in fixed wireless. Anyone else? Thank you. Uh, I have a question about uh, sort of the clash of two domains here, right? Because you, you have the um, you have the the entire mobile world and their protocols and their infrastructure that is now you know that's what we're dealing with in broadband form, especially in the WWC group. But I'm I'm just curious about your real world experience in that area. Was there any sort of legacy, uh, you know, management? in that area that, was, that people kind of push back on rather than doing USP on the fixed wireless access? No, in this case, uh, they were, uh, I mean, in, let, calling the saying that there was no pushback at all is probably an overstretch. <laughs> there was uh, a long internal process of deciding, uh, reviewing internally. Uh, they did it uh, in a pretty much autonomous way with limited amount of support and consultancy needed on the on what USP provided but uh, very quickly they for uh, what we could expect in these situations very quickly they were convinced that uh, that uh, USP allowed them to do things that they could not do in any in any other way what were those things <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you have heard about them this uh, this summit Jason happy to to go through them if uh, people need a quick refresh <laughs> i'm sure that uh, it will make sure that everyone can have a proper nap right after lunch <laughs> no i only say that because you know it's like we're always trying to figure out how to tell the story a little bit better here right um so i you know i am being a little tongue-in-cheek when i ask that because i probably know the answer to the question but i'm curious about you know what what were the things that pushed people in that direction you know, that were the kind of the final key use cases that were tipping point for them. Right. I mean, in this case, uh, I think uh, to some extent, it was also uh, a bit of, um, let's say, no, not a complaint, but a perception that uh, the previous vendor they were using may not have been as reactive mm -hmm. in addressing uh, some of the scenarios. So that can sometimes confuse the, the lines in what it is that is... Uh, a limitation of the protocol and of the technology versus what it is more an organizational issue right so that's another angle that right. played uh, played a role here oh. thanks isaac so i saw on one of your slides that talk about b2b to c is mm -hmm. that like a wholesale model then are they wholesaling the service to a, an mvno or a third party fwa it it's a different uh, conversation, but we are definitely looking uh, very strongly at um, at the neutral networks type of model, absolutely. And uh, actually, there were very good conversations about that uh, yesterday. In the in at the end, I had to leave this one for a minute. Apologies for that. About uh, how to set, for example, the limitation between what the wholesaler is providing and what the different ISPs would be providing to the different customers. Because sometimes there can be discussion of trying to share a single device versus the probably a bit more clear cut situation where each of the service providers, wholesaler or the smaller resellers, they provide their own part of the mm -hmm. network that they can take responsibility to. But absolutely, the ability to keep uh, to keep information from many of these boxes pretty much around uh, telemetry, quality of service uh, can help, even if uh, sometimes you may end up with different platforms on both sides, collecting information from different, uh, different parts. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you covered my question in the previous session, so... <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so I'll I'll keep quiet, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, um, Isaac. That was really awesome. <laughs>